evaporation and condensation. Uh, evaporation is a physical change going from liquid to a gas, and vaporization, these words are very similar, aren't they? It's something becoming a vapor, so going into the gas state. How fast something evaporates is going to depend on three different things. The amount of surface area, the amount, the, the temperature, and how strong the intermolecular forces are. When we have a liquid that evaporates easily, we say it's volatile. And those that do not evaporate easily are termed non-volatile. So one of the things that's always listed on paint these days is VOC, volatile organic compounds. A lot of organic compounds tend to be volatile. They're going to evaporate very quickly, and they, they help the paint to dry. But then they also get into the air, and you breathe them, and that's not necessarily good for you. So that can be a problem. So let's look at what's happening with evaporation. Here's an illustration of a beaker of water. We've got our little Mickey Mouse heads. And here's the water in the liquid state, and these particles are moving around. Now the particles at the surface, remember, are experiencing intermolecular forces to the sides and, and to, the, to the center of the liquid. They don't have as many forces holding them together as the ones lower down do. And all of these particles are moving around. There's an average kinetic energy. That average means that there's some that are higher in kinetic energy. They're moving faster and some that are moving slower. <coughs> so even though the water is not boiling at this temperature, there are some of these particles that have enough energy to break free from the intermolecular forces. Are you familiar with the game Red Rover? Yeah, I don't think they let kids play that at school anymore because somebody might get hurt. Yeah, well then I don't think we should go to school because you, people get hurt at school. You broke your arm playing Red Rover? Did you sue the school? No, because you, yeah, you cried and you got a cast and you healed up and you're fine, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so now you've got a great story. That's awesome. I've been using this analogy for a long time, and I've never found anybody, nobody's ever volunteered that they were actually injured playing Red Rover, so that's awesome. But Red Rover, if you're not familiar, a bunch of kids stand in a line holding hands, and across the way, you know, a field, the playground, stands a bunch of other kids. And the kids in the Red Rover line say, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Sally right over. And then Sally's supposed to run across this open space and try to break through the line, right? That's what Red Rover is. Okay, so the water molecules are playing Red Rover. And the, at the surface here, the particles are attracted to each other by intermolecular forces. Those are the children holding hands. And sometimes the Red Rover people are stronger, and sometimes they're weaker. If you get the kindergartners playing, it's going to be pretty easy to break through, right? So if you have weak intermolecular forces, and you've got a molecule that's moving up this way, does it need to be going very fast to break through? No, these are kindergartners. They're probably afraid. They might even let go before you get there, right? What if you had the O-line of the Fresno City football team playing Red Rover, and you're trying to break through them? You're going to have to be moving really fast. And you should probably be a pretty big person, too, if you want to break through. If the intramolecular forces are strong, like the O-line, then it's going to be very hard to get through. And you're going to have to be moving much faster to get through the line. Does that make sense? So among these water molecules, some of them are moving quickly, and some of them are moving slowly. The slower ones, if they get up here, they just kind of bump into the surface and they go back down. The ones that are moving fast, though, have enough kinetic energy to break through and they go into the gas state. And that's how water evaporates. Water will evaporate at 5 degrees Celsius. It's really cold. It's going to evaporate faster at 95 degrees Celsius, 
but it's still going to evaporate even at a very cold temperature. And this is, this is the process known as evaporation. Now, evaporation cools things down, right? Around here, some homes have swamp coolers. And those operate by, by running water over this fibrous pad and passing air through it and causing the water to evaporate. How does water evaporating cool something down? Well, kinetic energy is related to temperature. The temperature of this water is related to the average kinetic energy. Which particles are escaping when it evaporates? The high energy particles or the low energy particles? The high energy. So as the high energy particles leave through evaporation, what happens to the overall kinetic energy of the water? It goes down. And the temperature of it goes down. And that's how evaporation cools. And we, we can experience that personally on a warm day. You sweat a little bit, and a breeze comes, and it feels cool, right? Because it, it makes your sweat evaporate faster, which is pulling those higher energy particles away, and it cools you down. Um, we see that there's a relationship between temperature and rate of evaporation. If we look at an, a graph of energy here, here's the fraction of molecules that have this particular energy, and here's the amount of kinetic energy on the x-axis. So at a low temperature, our average kinetic energy is down here. And when we increase the temperature, we increase the average kinetic energy. The shape of this curve also changes a little bit. It becomes less um, defined, and it, it spreads out but the average energy is increasing. This dashed line here is representing the minimum amount of energy needed to escape, to evaporate. So it's like saying, okay, here's a bunch of people, and you can run this fast, and you can run that fast, and you can run this fast, but average, you know, is, this is how fast you can run. The average speed of these runners is not enough to break through the Red Rover line, but the fast people can break through. So here's the average and way up at the top, the very fastest can break through. And so those are the ones that will evaporate. If we increase the temperature, now we've given everybody an energy drink or something. And so everybody's you know, full of energy and they can run faster. Now at the higher temperature, our average kinetic energy, which is related to the speed at which these molecules are moving, is higher. And the area under this curve over here is larger. There are more particles that are able to escape because it's at a higher temperature, the average speed that the particles are moving at is greater. So evaporation is faster at a higher temperature. And I think we all know that um, just through being alive and looking at stuff. If you were to spill, I don't know, a tablespoon of water on the sidewalk, in August, or if you were to spill it on the same sidewalk in January, when is it going to evaporate faster? In August, when the sidewalk's hot, right? At high temperatures, we understand that things evaporate faster. This is just an explanation of why that happens. Condensation is the opposite. It's going from the gas to the liquid state. These are opposites. At some point, we, get, um, we can get the rate of condensation and the rate of evaporation becoming equal. And when that happens, we have a dynamic equilibrium. And this is one of the reasons I jumped ahead and talked about 15, chapter 15, is it makes talking about chapter 12 much easier. We'll get this dynamic equilibrium occurring when we have a closed container. We got closed? Here we got a closed container. So here's an Erlenmeyer flask with a stopper. And initially, there's essentially no water vapor in the air because it was a nice dry day. And we put water in here. And the water begins to evaporate. It evaporates. The water molecules go into the gas state. And they can't escape like they could from the beaker that was open. 
So they're going to bounce around this flask and some of them are eventually going to crash back into the water. When it crashes into the water, it gets stuck. It has condensed. So initially, all we have is evaporation. People moving from Narnia to Middle Earth. Sorry, I blanked. I can see the picture, I couldn't, couldn't read the names. People moving from Narnia to Middle Earth. And then as we get more and more molecules up here, the rate of condensation increases until we reach a point where the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are equal. And when that happens, you have a dynamic equilibrium. There is water in the gas state, and gases exert a pressure. The pressure of this gas is called the vapor pressure of water. And it depends only on the temperature of the water. If we increase the temperature of the water, that will increase the rate at which evaporation occurs. It doesn't affect condensation at all. The condensation will continue to increase as the amount of particles in the gas state increase until these become equal and then this concentration, if you will, of gases stays the same. So I think I missed something over here. Yeah, so vapor pressure, that's the partial pressure of the vapor when it's in dynamic equilibrium with its liquid. The vapor pressure increases with increasing temperature, and it decreases, um, I'm sorry, it increases with decreasing strength of intermolecular forces. So if we go back to this, if, if these have very weak forces, then the rate of evaporation will be higher. More of those molecules at that temperature are going to have enough energy to break out, and so they will. If the rate of evaporation is higher, then the vapor pressure is going to be higher. So vapor pressure depends on strength of intermolecular force. It depends on temperature. Um, it does not depend on surface area. Now, the rate of evaporation depends on surface area. In order for the particles to escape, they have to, have to get to the surface. And we know that if you have a cup of water in a tall, skinny glass, it's going to take a really long time for it to evaporate. But if you spill it on the floor and spread it around, it's going to evaporate much faster because the surface area is greater. The reason surface area doesn't affect vapor pressure is because it affects evaporation and condensation equally. If the surface area is larger, then there's more opportunity for the gas molecules to condense because there's a larger chance that they're going to run into the water. They're going to crash. Does that make sense? Any questions? When you can see it, it's really cool. I don't think most of you are seeing it yet. It's OK. Boiling. Boiling's related to all this. Boiling is going from a liquid to a gas, so it's related to evaporation. But it happens much faster than evaporation, doesn't it? The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the temperature, I'm sorry, the pressure above it. So we said that vapor pressure increased with increasing temperature. So as you increase the temperature of water, the vapor pressure goes up and up and up and up. And when you get to 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is one atmosphere. And at that point, there's enough energy for these molecules to get into the gas state inside the liquid water. They don't have to be on the surface anymore. And that's why we see these bubbles. These bubbles are bubbles of water vapor. And because they form a vapor and they're much less dense, they rise up and break. And the water molecules are going to escape. One of the coolest things from high school was in honors chemistry class, I had a crazy he seems crazy to us. He's probably very nice. I mean, he was a nice man, but we always thought he was kind of crazy. He ran around in a white lab coat, and his, his hair was a little bit like um, Einstein's. It was white and crazy. Anyway, one day he got a big vacuum flask, put some water in it, hooked it up to a very strong vacuum pump, 
and it just started chug, chug, chugging, and he started lecturing and talking and stuff. And after a while, the water in the flask started to boil. And then he made us all come up and put our hand on the flask. And of course, the first person is really scared to put their hand on the flask, right? Because boiling water is hot, isn't it? Not at really, really low pressure, it isn't. He reduced the pressure inside the flask until it equaled the vapor pressure of water at room temperature. The water was boiling at room temperature. It was mind-boggling. One of these days, I really want to get my hands on a pump that's strong enough to do that. Isn't the opposite also true? Uh, boiling point increases with pressure? Yes. And that is the principle of a pressure cooker. I've personally never used one, but maybe, maybe your grandma or somebody has used a pressure cooker. Use a pressure cooker because you could cook food faster. Why? See, the, the temperature of the water will get up to the boiling point, and it will not go any higher until it's all done boiling. So you're limited to 100 degrees Celsius. In a pressure cooker, where we would have, let's see if I can draw this. This would be interesting. In a pressure cooker, you're going to have a very tight-fitting lid on top of your container, and there's going to be some little valve, because you don't want the thing to explode. That would be bad. There's a lid on here, and it clamps on, and it's an airtight seal. And as the water begins to boil, the pressure builds up in here. When the pressure is higher, then the temperature needs to get higher before it can boil. And so by using a pressure cooker, you can boil, get water to boil at a temperature that's higher than 100 degrees Celsius, and that's going to cook your food faster. Um, you may have seen on, on recipes, or especially I always used to notice them on cake mix boxes, maybe because I've made so many cupcakes to send to school for people on their birthdays. And class size reduction going away, that was the worst, because now you have to bake two boxes of cupcakes, and how on earth do you get those to school, right? Okay, that, enough of the squirrel. On the cake mix box, there's high altitude instructions. At high altitudes, like up in Grant Grove, Denver, Rocky Mountain National Park, high elevations, the atmospheric pressure is lower. Water boils at a lower temperature. And so some recipes need to be adjusted because the cooking time is not going to be appropriate. Water boils at a lower temperature, and so it's going to take longer for the food to cook. So this idea of, of vapor pressure and boiling point um, has a lot of implications for regular life. Any questions? I love it when chemistry explains life. So once you, once you hit the boiling point, it doesn't matter how much extra heat you add. It's just going to make it boil faster. It's not going to go above the temperature that it started boiling at. So anytime you have a mixture of boiling water and steam, it's always going to be 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. It's only after all the water has been converted to steam then the temperature will go up really fast. That's when you left the pot on the stove. You were going to make spaghetti, but you left the pot on the stove and you forgot about it. And then you start smelling, ooh, what's that? Because all the water boiled away. Now your pot got really, really hot and you probably wrecked it. Never happened at my house. So here's a graph showing what happens. So here's the temperature, and this is representing adding heat. As we add heat, and here we're starting at about 20 degrees Celsius. We're adding heat. The temperature goes up. This makes sense to us. You add heat, it goes up, right? You heat it up. But when it gets to boiling, it's going to flatten out. It's going to stay at 100. So when you're making spaghetti, it, it starts boiling. You might as well put the spaghetti in right then. Because if you wait five minutes for the water to get hotter, it's not going to. It's going to stay the same temperature. After all of the energy has been used to convert the liquid into a gas, then the steam temperature can rise. Evaporation is 
endothermic. So if we think about boiling water, we understand that we need to put the pot on the stove and turn on the burner, right? And put heat into it to get it to boil. It absorbs energy. Energy has to go in. So evaporation is endothermic. And when we sweat, like I mentioned before, it absorbs heat from our bodies and cools us down. When you have a high humidity situation, anybody been to a humid area of the country? Florida, the Midwest? Greenhouse. A greenhouse, yeah. You go in there and it's like, and we have muggy days here when the, temp, you know, the, the relative humidity gets up to what, 40%? It's like, oh my goodness. Yeah, the day my husband and I got married in Iowa, it was 95 degrees and 95% humidity. It was like a sauna out there. The air just feels thick, and you sweat, and you're just hot and wet. It's like getting out of a shower, but you can't dry it off. Yeah, yeah, you get out of the shower, and you can't dry off, and fingernail polish takes forever to dry, your hair takes forever to dry, because the air is full of water. And so it doesn't evaporate very well. And so sweating doesn't cool you down, but you can't convince your body to stop sweating. And so you just go around wet all the time. And that's, that's one thing I like about the Central Valley is it is drier here. And so when you sweat, most of the time, it does some good. It actually cools you off. Another effect of this is, um, well, no, not really. Never mind. I'll go into that later. So evaporation is endothermic. Condensation is the opposite, so it must be exothermic. We don't really think of water condensing as being exothermic. We don't think of it as giving off energy, and yet it does. As steam condenses to a liquid on your skin, it releases a lot of heat and it can cause a severe burn. You can get a, a really nasty burn from steam, much worse than you'll get from boiling water because it's, that condensation releases a lot of energy. It goes into your skin, and you're in pain. So this exothermic nature of condensation is also a moderating factor for um, atmospheric temperatures. So every summer, there's like two weeks or so, right, where it doesn't cool down at night. And we go around complaining and belly aching because, you know, it's just not cooling down. That's when the humidity for this area is relatively high. And the temperature just doesn't quite get down to the dew point. As, as water condenses, it releases energy. And so it moderates the temperature. Here, when we have normal humidity, the temperature can vary by 40 degrees in a day, can't it? It could be 40 degrees at night and 80 degrees during the day. Easy, no problem. Where I grew up in, in Iowa and Minnesota in the summer, if it was 80 during the day, it'd probably be 70 overnight. Because it's humid. And it just does not cool down. And so because we live in an arid, a dry climate, then we get these big temperature swings. It has to do with water and the exothermic nature of water condensing. 